open AI is getting into the consulting game. They are getting into high touch consulting, mimicking the model that's been popularized by defense tech company like Palantir. Um, OpenAI is now offering fine-tuned enterprise-grade AI solution built by its own engineers, but only to clients willing to spend at least $10 million. So these custom services involve tweaking models like GPT-4.0 using a company's proprietary data, then building apps, often chatbots, tailored to specific business needs. So this puts OpenAI in direct competition with the consulting giants like Accenture, and software firms like Palantir. Palantir has kind of gotten very good at doing this thing where they have these, quote, forward deployed engineers that go into organizations and build out uh, services and implement software. And so OpenAI has actually been hiring to build out its own consulting team from some of those people. The clients for OpenAI already include the Pentagon, which has signed a $200 million deal and Southeast Asia's Grab, which used OpenAI to map roadways using street-level imagery. Now, OpenAI says these partnerships are about solving harder billion-dollar problems and giving customers insight into what's next, including future enterprise uses for, say, the AI-powered device it's co-developing with former Apple designer Johnny I, which we will talk about again in a second here. But first, Paul, this seems like a pretty big move for OpenAI. Like, are they seriously now competing with companies like Accenture, for instance? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, it, it's tough. So, you know, I experienced this firsthand and Mike, you were you were there as well. Um, so I've mentioned this before, my former marketing agency was HubSpot's first partner back in 2007. So we were the origin of their partner ecosystem. Today, their solution partners ecosystem. And so we became a reseller of HubSpot software, but more a value added partner where HubSpot would sell software and then we would provide the services to create value for that software. So if an organization were to buy HubSpot and I'll integrate it to CRM, build their website, build a social strategy, build an inbound content strategy, whatever, they built the software, sold the software, we wrapped services on that software. And it was great. It was a very profitable business. Um, it's kind of a proven model to have these outside partners that that help do the work and bring the value to the hardware and the software. And so in the early days of HubSpot, they didn't want to have services inside because they had yet to IPO. I mean, when I started with them in 2007, this was seven years prior to their IPO. And so even back then, they had a vision of becoming a publicly traded company, building you know, a massive multi-billion dollar company, which they obviously succeeded at. And to them, they didn't want to have more than a certain percentage of their revenue coming from services because it would actually reduce their overall valuation. And so, it, you know, things have evolved, obviously, since 2007. But generally, the playbook is very similar that these companies that provide the software or in this case, the AI models, you don't want to have 50 percent of your revenue coming in from services. It's yeah. nowhere near the margins of a software business. Um, services are hard. It requires humans to deliver work, at least until OpenAI maybe replaces the need for the humans. But like in theory, you got to go hire people. You have to build this entire forward engineering department or whatever they're building. And so the temptation to offer services for people like OpenAI and 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 in my day, like HubSpot, um, one is there's revenue growth. And obviously here there, there's tremendous revenue growth. I mean, we'll talk in, in one of the rapid fire items later today about like Accenture and, and what they're generating. But I mean, I, I would imagine that OpenAI probably looks at this as a five to $10 billion a year service business out of the gate. Like there's no reason it couldn't be. And over time, it, it may be a 50 to $100 billion annual business if they wanted to build services as a major revenue component. So that's a that's the first thing. The second is quality control. So if you're relying on other people to do the work, you lose the ability to control how the models are being fine tuned and how they're being integrated and things like that. And that becomes a real challenge as you're trying to scale. And that leads to the third real pressure, which is performance. So in HubSpot's case, the the Early days, when you relied on outside partners to do the onboarding, to do the customization of the different hubs, you really needed those, those people to not only provide quality services, you needed it to lead to higher adoption rates, higher utilization rates, higher customer happiness, um, value creation. 
And it had to prove out that it actually, you retained more of your clients, your customers, if an agency was involved, if an mm -hmm. outside partner was involved. And so if you're open AI and you're in this moment where you're creating these incredible models and you're kind of relying on outside parties like an Accenture to do the work, to do the onboarding, the fine tuning, and maybe you're seeing it's not going the way you would want it to go, then there becomes this like, okay, we have to get into this game because the, the people aren't getting the value they should be out of our models. We have to do the fine tuning ourselves. We have to provide more services. So I don't know what their roadmap is here, but this is an age old issue where the creator of the product wants more control and wants to, um, you know, who believes that they can drive greater performance, adoption, utilization, retention, value creation, if they're more involved mm. versus relying on an outside partner ecosystem. And so I, I think that that's what's happening here. Now, the interesting part, and you kind of alluded to this is like, my first thought was um, Thinking Machines Lab. So Mira Marathi's new startup. This is what we learned last week that they're doing is like they're basically providing fine tuning on models. Now we don't know if Thinking Machines is going to build its own models or not, but the idea is they're going to pipe kind of this reinforcement learning and fine tuning on top of it. Um, I would think this is creeping into Microsoft territory. Mm. You know, you're starting to kind of come up there. Uh, Cohere is another uh, company that we've talked about many times, a Canadian AI lab that is doing something similar. It's all about fine tuning these smaller models and, and, and adapting them for enterprises. So, yeah, I mean, I think we're just going to see a massive rush for this kind of stuff. And, and it'll be interesting to see what OpenAI's formulas are, because again, I, maybe they're not thinking about it that far ahead, but back in the day, there were formulas that said, if you want to eventually IPO, you cannot have services in excess of X of your revenue. Hmm. And I know for HubSpot over time, they have generated more and more revenue from their services. At some point, they found that they had to get more involved in the onboarding process. They had to be more involved to drive more retention. Um, and so like, yeah, I don't know. There's always that allure to just start bringing this stuff in house. And that's honestly like back in 2008, when I started building my agency to be HubSpot's first partner, I asked them point blank, I was like, are you guys gonna build an agency? Like, why wouldn't you just do this in house? And that was the answer I got is we can't, like we can't have that much revenue uh, coming from services. I was like, all right, cool, then I'll, I'll do it. And that led to me writing the marketing agency blueprint and, you know, kind of being, um, you know, as high profile as I was about what we were doing with HubSpot in those early days.